You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You may find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find leaders and legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle and me at leadersandlegends.net. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Professor Craig Simons. I would like to read all of his citations and awards, but this this fellow has won more awards than Meryl Streep, and we probably couldn't get through them all in our time together, but we're going to go through them just a little bit. Professor Simons was the distinguished visiting Ernest J. King Professor of Maritime History for the academic years 2017 2020 at the U.S. Naval War College. He is also Professor Emeritus at the United States Naval Academy, where he served as Chairman of the History Department. And if you don't know who Ernest King is, you should you should take a gander into his career. Five Star Admiral, Chief of Naval Operations during World War II, I think. Uh, Professor Simons is also a distinguished historian of the American Civil War, not just maritime history. His book, Lincoln and His Admirals, received the coveted Lincoln Prize. His book, Neptune, The Allied Invasion of Europe and the D-Day Landings, was the 2015 recipient of the prestigious Samuel Eliot Morrison Award for Naval Literature. He also received the Theodore and Franklin D. Roosevelt Prize in Naval History. He earned his Bachelor of Arts from UCLA and his Master's and PhD from the University of Florida. We need to ask if he had any classes with uh, Coach uh, Steve Spurrier, who won the Heisman, 1966, I believe. Dr. Simons is also a veteran, having served in the United States Naval Reserve, just like the actor Glenn Ford. What's the connection? Glenn Ford played Admiral Raymond Spruance in the movie Midway. We love Admiral Spruance here in Indianapolis as he attended Short Ridge High School, an IPS kid. And when you Google his name, one of the first faces you see is that of Tom Hanks. And we're going to ask him about that as well. And what was it like to teach Harrison Ford how to be a naval history professor? Professor Simons, thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, my gosh. What an introduction. I can't possibly live up to that. (laughs) But thank you for having me. This should be fun. I look forward to our conversation. Well, you're safe in history nerddom here. Uh, We are very honored to have you. Literally, I could have listed a dozen more awards and recognitions. You are clearly a a leader in your field and and much beloved based on all the writing uh, that you've done and the reading that I took and doing my research on you. We're thrilled to have you here. First question I have to ask is, do you know Steve Spurrier? Well, no, I do not know him personally, but there is a connection. My wife and I met in graduate school at the University of Florida, and one of our first dates was to a football game, and we did see him play. So does that count? (laughs) It counts a little bit. Okay. Uh, And let me ask about, since I teased these two actors, uh, there's a wonderful video of Tom Hanks uh, giving you great credit uh, for help in a movie I believe he was involved in. Tell us a little bit about that, please. 
Well, they say that Tom Hanks is the nicest man in Hollywood. He may be the nicest man on the planet. He was very kind to me in that uh, little video. Uh, it came about because he had read The Good Shepherd by C.S. Forster. C.S. Forster is one of my favorite writers. He, of course, is the author of all the Hornblower books, which when I was 10, 11, 12 is what got me hooked into naval history in the first place. But in any case, Tom read The Good Shepherd, and he thought this would make a great movie. So he wrote, based on the novel, a screenplay. And he sent it to me and said, have I got this pretty much right? Are there any glitches in here? What do I need to fix? And I sent him back 10 pages or so of suggestions. And he said, I'm going to come down and talk to you. He came down by train from New York and picked him up at uh, the New Carrollton Station. And he spent the day with me. Um, we toured the academy. We went on a, a warship to get a sense of what the bridge was like. And he was very appreciative of all of that. Now, unbeknownst to me, uh, the group for whom I was providing a speech uh, went to him independently and said, hey, Craig Simons is going to come give us a speech. Would you introduce him? And he said, of course, I'll do that, which is where that video came from. So it was very kind of him to do it. Uh, I didn't do all that much for him. I think I helped a little bit with the movie Greyhound, which everybody should go see. Uh, very realistic, in my opinion. Uh, so that's the Tom Hanks story. You said he reached out to you. How did he find you? Well, how did you find me? Oh, my friend, Ruth Squalachi, <laughs> who, who loves you dearly. That's how I found you. Um, I don't know. I guess he asked somebody who's a naval historian who knows something about boats. And uh, my name came up. <laughs> and very quickly uh, for the movie, I believe Patriot Games, in which Harrison Ford plays a a naval historian who gets caught up in an IRA plot involving the royal family. Uh, you, yeah, you, you met Mr. Ford. I did. Uh, I was chairman of the history department at the time. And the, the book, Patriot Games, is about a naval academy professor who used to work for the head of the CIA and who spent a year in England, during which time he saved the life of the royal family. Now, three of those things match up with me. I was a history professor at the Naval Academy. Uh, I did work for the director of the CIA, Stansfield Turner, when I was in uniform. And uh, I did spend a year teaching at Britannia Royal Naval College. I did not, however, save the life of the royal family, that minor detail. But in any case, he decided he would uh, follow me around for a day to get the sense of what it was like. So he came to my class. And you know how it is. People don't expect to see someone uh, so we walked in together and he sat in the back of the room and most of the class did not think anything of it. I mean, here's a visitor to class. A few did recognize him. But then about two minutes into class, a midshipman arrived late. Now, when this happens at the Naval Academy, the midshipman knocks on the door, says, sir, permission to come aboard. And I said, yeah, come on in, come on in. So he walked in, went to the back room and there's a guy sitting in his chair and he said, sir, you're in my chair. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. And he got up and moved. And a little while later, he left the room. Well, immediately, the entire class turned on this guy and said, you moron, you <laughs> just told Harrison Ford to get out of your chair. And he said, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> Did you, one of our Indiana federal senators, Todd Young, is a Naval Academy graduate. I would imagine you have lots of former students uh, serving in different places in government? I do. Uh, it's really uh, humbling in a lot of ways. I get calls from students that I taught 20, 25 years ago who will call me and say, you know, I was thinking about your class and how important it was to me and so on and so on. And I'll often say something like, well, that's great. What are you doing now? And I'll get an answer like, well, I'm a congressman or in one case, <laughs> I, I'm the governor of Missouri. He says, oh, sorry, Matt, I didn't know. Um <laughs> The last three secretaries of the Navy are all former students of mine. So, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's a great place to teach and work. Yeah, Senator Young graduated from the Naval Academy. I'm not sure when then served in the Marine Corps and served in Congress and then was elected to the United States Senate in 2016. Um, yeah, great. I don't recall having him in class, but I may have. Well, I know he's a history buff, so I'd be surprised if he didn't take you at one point. I've not been to the Naval Academy. I've been to West Point to see it. But everyone who 
who goes there to visit or for instruction talks about how beautiful it is. What draws you to the Naval Academy at Annapolis? Well, in 1976, when I was hired as an assistant professor, what drew me to the Naval Academy was the fact that it was a job. You know, if you're a brand new (laughs) PhD historian looking for a tenure track position, uh, (laughs) pretty much whatever you can get your hands on is what you'll take. But I was fortunate enough, having specialized in naval history, that that's what they were looking for that year. I think my life has been just absolutely uh, defined by the lucky moments, uh, and that's certainly one of them. But not all of your writing has has been about the sea, and I want to talk about a, a couple of, of other books that you've written first uh, before we spend the bulk of our time on, on naval history, and that is um, what what made you write about uh, Joseph E. Johnston. He was a Confederate general. He was a uh, general of, I think he was maybe quartermaster general or uh, in the uh, American army before the Civil War. Yes. Uh, what what made you write about him? And, and was it a planned kind of departure from your normal research? Well, my second year at the Naval Academy, the individual who had been teaching the Civil War course uh, retired. And um, I had done some work in the Civil War. They asked me to teach that course. So I taught the Civil War course for 28, 29 years uh, at the academy. So that's where my teaching was focused. And as I worked on that uh, in class, it occurred to me that this enigmatic individual, Joseph E. Johnston, who was Robert E. Lee's predecessor in command of the Confederate Army in Virginia and a close friend of Robert E. Lee, as a matter of fact, they were classmates at West Point, uh, had no good biography. There had been one written many years before Mm -hmm. that was kind of superficial, and I thought this needs investigation. Um, So I uh, sent out a proposal to a couple of presses, and they said, go ahead and do it. And that turned into a major project for me. That book, by the way, is now 23 years old and still in print. So uh, somebody else thought he needed a biography, too, I guess. But he's an interesting guy. He... uh, He did not have a lot of success in the field. Uh, He's often portrayed as being too uh, reluctant to take on the enemy, shall we say, always looking in the rearview mirror for an exit, his critics will say. And he clashed frequently with Jefferson Davis in a civil-military relations confrontation. Uh, But he does personify, in a lot of ways, many of the problems the Confederacy faced in that war. And I think exploring his participation in that war really uh, casts a light on the co- Confederate experience. What well, is often awesome, often portrayed that Johnston's injury was shot, I think at Seven Pines That's or, correct. Fa- or Fair Oaks, depends on what you want to call it, that his, his wounding was this amazing stroke of luck for the Army of Northern Virginia because now they have Lee. But it really wasn't looked at in that vein at the time, because Johnston was held in such high regard and Lee's uh, previous only little kind of minor command uh, in West Virginia, I think, uh, did not uh, turn out all that well. Yeah, I think that's true. At the time, the fact that the commanding general was seriously wounded in a battle outside Richmond seemed like horrible news to the Confederate government and the Confederate cause. Only later did it become apparent that having Robert E. Lee step into that position uh, was, in fact, a a great stroke of luck for the Confederacy. But that quotation, interestingly enough, actually comes from Joe Johnston. Later in life, uh, when the war was over, he said, uh, the bullet that struck me down was the best bullet ever fired in favor of the Confederacy because it brought Robert E. Lee to command. Now, that sounds very self-deprecating, but then he went on to say in the next sentence, and that is because Robert E. Lee could get along with Jefferson Davis, and I couldn't. In other words, I would have been more successful if I didn't have Jefferson Davis to deal with as chief executive. Well, we we, we can't all be Braxton Bragg, right? The uh, sycophantic. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> but as part of the is part of the uh, animus between Davis and Johnston is, if I recall correctly, is related to rank that uh, the Confederacy created full generals long before the North did. And in 
the listing of the full generals created by Jefferson Davis and the uh, Confederate government. Uh, Samuel Cooper was number one, and Albert Sidney Johnston was number two. Lee was number three. Johnston, uh, Joseph E. Johnston, number four, and Pierre Beauregard was fifth. And Johnston took great umbrage at that because he outranked Lee in the peacetime United States Army. And everything I've ever read about Johnston was how he was such a man of honor and very prickly about how he was treated. Yeah, touchy is probably a good word. And I think that's a word that applies to a lot of 19th century officers. The idea that someone would impugn your honor is such a threat. I mean, that's why duels were fought all the time in the 19th century. How dare you suggest that I'm not honorable, this kind of business. But um, it's a silly quarrel because the legislation that established the rank said the officers shall hold rank in the same order in which they held rank in the old army, which is how they referred to the U.S. Army. And what the government did was arrange them by order of their graduation from West Point. If you look at the list, the, the most senior class of 1815, Albert Sidney Johnson was number one because of the rank that he held at West Point. Now, Johnson had been a general in the Union Army, quartermaster general, as you Mm -hmm. pointed out, and Lee had been a colonel. So Johnson assumed, I'll be ahead of Lee. But they both graduated in the same class, except that Lee ranked second, and Johnson ranked, I think, 26th or something. So that's the way Cooper set it up. Well, all Johnson had to do was, you know, maybe... (laughs) <laughs> say, gee, how come? But no, 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 he couldn't do that. He had to write this, oh, my honor is impugned. How dare you? And that is kind of a metaphor for their whole relationship. And the fact that he was given the command of what was clearly the preeminent fighting force within the Confederacy was not a salve for his ego. No, I, he was prickly. He was touchy. Uh in silly sorts of ways. But in that respect, he was much like his peers in the 19th century. There were others who complained about their status and their rank, some who resigned because of it. It is said that Johnston, Joseph E. Johnston, was the best shot in the army. But when challenged to prove it, and not in an adversarial way, he would often come up with an excuse like, the bird is too low or the wind is is too strong and he wouldn't pull the trigger that having established that reputation, he didn't want to ruin it. Did that translate to his generalship? You know, I don't, first of all, I don't know that that's true. That story comes from Mary Chestnut. She put it in her diary. She got it from her husband, James Chestnut, when they were sitting around talking about Joseph E. Johnson in 1864. And she wrote in her diary, this is what they said about him. They went out to shoot birds and he never fired a shot because they're, you know, and they used that as a metaphor to explain why he couldn't launch an attack. Oh, the enemy's too strong, or he's too far away, or he's this, or he's that, or I'm out of food, or I need to, that there was always some reason why he couldn't do something. So the story may not be true, although the metaphor may in fact be accurate. He famously tangled, before we move on, uh, with William Tecumseh Sherman and, and came out the worst of it, clearly, but they reconciled is not the right term, but they were on terms, good terms after the war. So well, much so. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and it comes back to the point of honor again, because after the war, William T. Sherman, who did beat Johnston in that famous 1864 Atlanta campaign, uh, Sherman made a point of saying in his memoirs and elsewhere publicly that the most talented mm-hmm. person he ever fought against was Joseph E. Johnson. I could never pin him down. I could never get around his flank. I could, And those are all true things. Johnson maneuvered his army very cleverly, made it hard for Sherman to do what he wanted to do, which is punch it in the nose. So Johnson appreciated the kind words that Sherman had to say about him. And when Sherman died, he predeceased Johnston and was buried in New York on a winter's day, February, I believe. And Johnston was asked to be an honorary pallbearer. 
which is quite something. So he went and he's standing there graveside in the cold with the rain falling. And someone said, General, you must put on your hat. You will catch cold. And he said, if I were lying there and he were standing here, he would not put on his hat. So he stood there throughout the service, caught a cold and died. Very soon after the funeral, as I recall. Yes. Well, it's a matter of weeks, I think, or months. Yeah. Uh, Grant held, Ulysses S. Grant held Johnston in the same esteem, if memory serves. He was very much a an admirer of the sort of things that uh, Sherman described as well. Well, Johnston was slippery. In, in, in modern 21st century warfare, he's the kind of opponent America hates because he always slides away to fight the next day. You can never pin him down, close off his flanks, and destroy his army. Uh, and that bothered both Sherman and Grant because they wanted to apply the coup de grace and, and destroy him. And Johnston kept his army around to fight another day. Now, Southerners, who wanted to win this in one great battle as well, did not necessarily admire the slipping and sliding and retreating. So in the war's aftermath, seeking for a reason why we didn't win, we being the South in this particular case, uh, many said, well, Joe Johnson just wouldn't stand up and fight. He just didn't have it in him. Do you think Johnston could have held on to Atlanta, uh, which wasn't even the capital of Georgia, I think? Uh, no, it wasn't. but you know, that's a great question. It's one of those what if questions. So historians love these because we can say anything and nobody can contradict <laughs> us. Here, here goes. Let's play this game. Let's suppose Johnston keeps Sherman out of Atlanta past November. Not exactly. that he can defend it, not that he can defeat Sherman, but he hangs on to it. He moves around, he slips, he slides, and Atlanta is still being held by the South when the national elections come around. Mm -hmm. Does that conceivably affect the outcome of that election? George McClellan is elected president. And if so, does McClellan, as according to the Democratic Convention at the day, say that he will open negotiations for a peace, the Confederacy gets its independence, so on and so on? Well, I don't know. I mean, is it? it's remotely possible, I suppose. Uh, but it depends on people acting in a way that is not consistent with their culture. And there were the uh, victories by Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley that boosted uh, Northern right. morale as well. Right, right. Let me ask you quickly about another book that you wrote about the Civil War, The Battle of Gettysburg. Um, I've talked about this battle a few times on with other uh, Leaders and Legends podcast guests, including Peter Carmichael. I think Brooke Simpson and I talked about it uh, for a little bit. Um, I am speaking of counterfactuals, and you can tell me, take as much time as you like to tell me how wrong I am. I just feel in the grand scheme of the Civil War that that other than inspiring a pretty darn good speech, Gettysburg is overrated as a watershed event. The floor is <laughs> the floor is yours. There's a whole school of Civil War historians, and I am a, a part time member of that school that holds that the war was won and lost in the Western theater. The fall of Vicksburg, the capture of Chattanooga, the campaign to Atlanta, the capture of Mobile, all of these things had a greater strategic impact on the outcome of the Civil War than almost anything that happened in that 100-mile corridor between Washington and Richmond. Now, the East got all the headlines because, of course, that's where the newspapers are, and the battles were huge, and many people died. But it took place in a, in a theater, a war theater the size of Connecticut. Whereas the Western theater took place in a theater the size of Alaska. So from my point of view, if, if it's not quite an exaggeration to say that Gettysburg was irrelevant, I think it is fair to say that it's not as important, not as strategically significant as the Western theater as a whole. Now, of course, Gettysburg has a moral element, too. Uh, this was, and most people recognize this at the time, Lee's most dramatic foray into the North, and that it was turned back and that he had to go south, that there would never be another Confederate invasion of the North. All of that suggests that it's a kind of turning point. But keep this in mind, too. 
there were far more casualties in the Civil War, both killed and wounded, in the period after the Battle of Gettysburg mm-hmm. than up to and including Gettysburg. So that big war, all that campaign and the wilderness and, and Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor and Petersburg all still had to be fought after Gettysburg. So that Gettysburg, if you say it's a turning point, I'm not sure it was as big a turning point as Vicksburg in the West. So I'm on your side. (laughs) Well, maybe I should shut up, but I'll just say a couple more things very quickly. It just seemed to me that Gettysburg, I mean, take the address, which is November, November 19th, I think, 1863. Take that out of the equation. And at the same time, understand that the, the Lee's ability to have an effective offensive fighting force was significantly um, uh, damaged by Gettysburg. But to me, the defining battle of the war or the battle that I would say launched the Confederates on the path to uh, defeat was Shiloh. For various reasons, it cemented the Grant Sherman friendship, which rode through the war uh, to, to victory. Um, if if Grant had died, speaking of counterfactuals, instead of Albert Sidney Johnston dying, how much would that have altered uh, how the war was fought? And if the war would have been won on on any timetable, uh, the casualties at Shiloh, I believe, exceeded all the casualties in every battle ever fought in the American uh, continent up until the Battle of Shiloh. That's how bloody it was. It convinced people that the war could not be negotiated. There wasn't going to be this one big battle and everyone was then going to negotiate that the Confederates were committed to uh, fighting for their uh, secession. And quite frankly, uh, to me, the great figure of the war, accepting Lincoln, of course, is Ulysses S. Grant. And while he barely hung on, he showed through his generalship that uh, he was there to fight the South as long as they wanted to keep fighting. So to me, Shiloh is the most important battle of the war for all those reasons. And probably some more I can't think of. That's a perfectly defensible position. Whip them tomorrow though. (laughs) You know what Shiloh does is as you suggested, it shows what this war is going to be. It's not going to be a hundred casualties, a thousand casualties. It's going to be thousands and tens of thousands of casualties. For the South to win this war, they can only win this politically. They can win it by convincing the Northern electorate that Lincoln's uh, Union strategy is unacceptable. When Lincoln wins re-election in November of 1864, the war is over for the South. They cannot any longer win this war. Uh, For the North to win the war, it's a much higher bar. They have to... Um, invade, conquer, and occupy all of the Confederacy forever. And so that's not going to be possible without all those horrible casualties. Tragic as they were, they were necessary to convince the Southern government and the Southern people that they were not going to be able to have their own Southern empire of slavery, and, and they were going to have to submit to being in the Union. It's gratifying to hear you say that because however much you can, one can say, well, you know, states' rights was a valid uh, political theory and secession was something that it was existed in the Southern mindset through John C. Calhoun and others. Uh, I've, I've often said that, OK, you can make all those arguments you want and you can celebrate all of that you want. But when Lincoln won reelection, it was all over. And there's no excuse for the except hubris and some sort of sanguinary mindset. There's no excuse for Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy continuing beyond the election. You know, that's true. But it's also very hard for anyone, either group or individual, to say, well, I was wrong about all this and all the sacrifice I've made was dumb. I shouldn't have done it. Now, here we are today Mm -hmm. being chased out of Afghanistan and it's humiliating and embarrassing. It's been 20 years. So the reason is because four presidents, two of each party, could not confront and say, well, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have done this and let's, let's get out. So here we are. 
So do you think that the Davis and the Lees and the Johnstons and the Forrests and everything of the world, that, that they were guilty of treason in a greater degree before Nixon, Nixon, for heaven's sakes, before that was the last podcast, before Lincoln's reelection, that, that there is a bifurcation there in, in how we should look at them? I think all of those people believed they were being true to what they thought was their constitutional and political right. Now, I think they were wrong in believing that, but they absolutely believed it. Did they fight against the government of the United States? Yes, they did. And for that reason, they should not necessarily be honored as great heroes. I think if we're going to get into this, this whole statuary thing, um, we, don't, we don't have to. I, we don't have to, Professor. I was just saying that that the difference between that to me, there's a qualitative difference between the actions before Lincoln's reelect when you could say, all right, there's politically, to your point, politically a chance for us to win politically. And then after his reelect, where there's no chance for them to win politically. Arguably, there was no chance for the American revolutionaries to win after Valley Forge. They were toast. They'd lost New York. They'd lost New Jersey. Mm -hmm. The British held Boston. They held all the cities along the coast. They had a dominant Navy. The American revolutionaries had little to nothing. They had no hope. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the way Southerners Southerners looked at it. They thought of themselves as the next generation of revolutionaries. You won the anyway. prestigious Lincoln Prize. No, no, no. Because that question of the election of Lincoln and the fact that the war continued and thousands of people died in the time period from November of 64 to April of 65, it, to me is a very I wish I wish there was more written about that time period and the mindset of the folks who allowed it to go on, even though the union by that time had just such overwhelming superiority in almost everything. And it had frankly scared the living hell out of the Europeans. So they weren't going to help the Confederates. You won the Lincoln prize for your book, Lincoln and his admirals. Is it, is it a general sense among historians perhaps that the Naval side of the American civil war is underrepresented? And did you want to try to correct this in some way? That's mostly true. Um, Let me add, by the way, that I shared uh, the Bicentennial Lincoln Prize in 2009 with Jim McPherson. Uh, Jim's a very good friend of mine, and he had won previously for another book. And then he and I shared the prize in 2009, which uh, is a great honor to me because I think he is a great historian. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing about the Civil War, the Civil War is won and lost on the ground. It was not a naval war, uh, primarily or, or I don't even can't put a percentage on it. Um, But because of that, uh, the naval side is often underrepresented. And and yes, that's part of the reason I wanted to to do this project. But another is that I think one of the really great books written about the Civil War is by T. Harry Williams, Mm -hmm. Lincoln and his generals, which was back in the 1950s. I cut my teeth on that when I was a fairly young scholar. And I thought this guy calls a spade a spade, and he takes no prisoners. And this is a great book because T. Harry Williams had a point to make, and it was an important point. It's one almost everybody has bought into nowadays that Lincoln was a greater natural strategist than any of his generals, including arguably Ulysses S. Grant, not because he went to West Point, which he didn't, but because he had the kind of temperament that allowed him to consider questions of the widest dimension and come up with commonsensical answers. And we say, well, that's just being a regular guy, but it's extraordinarily (laughs) rare. So I wanted to examine how he managed the war, the naval war, Lincoln and his admirals. So that's where the book came from. Well, T. Harry Williams' book, Lincoln and his generals, is so good. As, as is every book ever written by Professor James McPherson, I should throw out there. I mean, I if, you want, too. if you want to understand this and want to understand the Civil War, you should start with James McPherson's works on all subjects. Uh, how did? By the, way, by the way, Robert, let me interrupt you. To uh, I hate to do this, but I'm going to on a correction. Um, Go ahead. I was talking with Jim one time. We were having a drink or something, and, and he, he mentioned everybody calls him James McPherson. He said, but. My family has always said there is no fear in McPherson. 
Well, if I could ever get him on the podcast, I will call him whatever he would like to be called. <laughs> His eminence. Yeah. Unaffects totally. Maximus, whatever he's, yeah. whatever he's down for. Yeah. How did Lincoln manage his admirals? He had some very tough, very strong minded uh, leaders in the United States Navy during the Civil War. And, and how did he how did he interact with them? And and talk a little bit, please, about Gideon Wells, who was the who's the very famous sort of uh, what's the word to describe Jefferson He's a character. Davis? Uh, dyspeptic, I think is That's the word. Do. <laughs> Gideon Wells, who was Secretary of the Navy during the Civil War. Right. Who Lincoln called Father Neptune because of his long white beard. Mm-hmm. Um, there are differences in the way you would manage or the way Lincoln managed his generals and his admirals. And one of the differences is that a lot of the generals, many of them West Point graduates, had left the service and done something else. They became bankers or railroad men or they became business people of some kind. And then when war began, got back into the service and and they had been a first lieutenant and now they're a brigadier general or a major general. Boom. Uh, Navy people tended to be individuals who had stayed in the service from not necessarily from Annapolis because Annapolis didn't exist until 1845. So a lot of them had come up the old fashioned ways midshipmen learning on the job, on shipboard. There were, of course, some who were academy graduates, but they tended to be lower in rank because the academy was so new. So in dealing with the naval personnel, he's dealing with professionals of long service. And none of them, virtually none of them, were what we would call political admirals. That is somebody who said, well, I'm the mayor of a town or I'm a congressman. I know how to do things. Make me an admiral. Well, you can't do that. I often make the joke, especially when I'm talking to an army audience, I say, because you could do that in the army, but in the Navy, you actually had to know stuff. Well, you know, I was in the army for three years, so, you know, I'll, I'll take that insult and All right. and, and that's, say that's that, on you, Robert. that uh, uh, I, so I was no good. Benjamin Butler in the army. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a good example of a political general. <laughs> Now, he did have generals that caused him, politi- uh, excuse me, admirals that caused him political problems. And DuPont, Samuel Francis DuPont, was probably the most senior of those. He had continuous service for 40 years. He was the head of the strategy board when the war broke out. He organized the blockade itself. But uh, somewhat perhaps like Joe Johnston, he was reluctant to take his fleet straight into Charleston Harbor and retake Fort Sumter. Now, there's lots of very practical reasons why he should not have done that. You can't just steam a fleet into the cul-de-sac of Charleston Harbor, surrounded as it was by land-based batteries, and seize a fort. Uh, And he tried to explain that to Gideon Wells. But Gideon Wells wanted a Navy victory. It was important Mm. to him to have a Navy victory. The Army's getting all these headlines. If we recapture Fort Sumter, think how good that will make the Navy look. And the two of them just never managed to see eye to eye on that. And in the end, DuPont himself was fired. So there were some problems, um, but not perhaps as many. And I think it's because of the absence of political admirals as opposed to political generals. We mentioned Ulysses S. Grant before, and as an unabashed fan, let me please uh, get your thoughts on, uh, I really get the sense that he pioneered sort of the Army-Navy cooperation during the war, and please push back his his cooperation with with Foote, Admiral Foote, was he a Commodore Commodore, uh, during during, uh, Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, and then obviously with Porter and later on in the war and then obviously Vicksburg which was certainly a combined army navy operation uh, do you think that grant just was in a situation where he encountered rivers and admirals in the navy more or or he really personally thought this we don't care who gets the credit we just need to win i think it's more of the latter i mean the, the thing to say about grant is he's the first modern general Uh, Generals in the 19th century tended to think of themselves as Napoleon. They would be in the field. They would be directing troops. You know, they would see him up on a hill on horseback and he would wave his arm and a brigade would attack or a division would move. Uh, 
In other words, orchestrating a battle in the field. Grant is a modern general because he's orchestrating a theater. Uh, he does it in the West in the Vicksburg campaign, and he does it in the East, obviously, with what's often called the Overland campaign that culminates in the siege of Petersburg and the capture of Richmond. And because he is a modern general, he understands that the combination of an army and a navy working in cooperation is greater than the sum of its parts. Neither the army, the Union army, nor the Union navy could have captured Vicksburg. Together, they made it look relatively easy. But but I think he's almost, not quite unique in that respect, but nearly so in appreciating uh, the theater-sized planning that's necessary in a modern war and the essential ingredient of joint forces working cooperatively. So those two things made him a modern general fighting in America's first modern war. If you could have witnessed any event in the Civil War, which event would you choose? <laughs> Be there as it happens. Oh, my gosh. What a question. Um, I guess I'd like to sit in on one of Lincoln's cabinet meetings and maybe the cabinet meeting when he explained to them that I uh, I have this envelope I want all of you to sign. I'm not going to let you read it, uh, but I want to sign it and date it so that you will witness that I have written this thing. And it was the famous envelope that he wrote. It looks now like I will not be reelected. And if not, I will have to behave in a way to bring this war to a conclusion before my successor takes my job, because clearly, based on his campaign, it will be impossible to win the war after he becomes president. Uh, so, so many things are interesting there. The dynamic in the room, the attitude of the others, his getting them to sign it, his views about, you know, I'm probably going to lose. And if I do, that means the end of the country. But if I lose, I'll, I'll leave, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um it's just, I think that would have been an interesting moment to observe. Or the cabinet meeting where he punked out the Secretary of Treasury for being a mendacious, ambitious ass. <laughs> that, I think, took place in the Oval Office when Sam and Chase came in and said, uh, you know, here's my resignation. And Lincoln, expecting Lincoln to say, oh, no, you can't resign. And Lincoln snatched it and said, I'll let, take that. Let me see it. Uh, I'm surprised as a naval historian, forgive me for, for extending this, this particular question, that you wouldn't have wanted to see the running of the batteries at Fixburg or the uh, Hampton Roads. The well, you ask what I would want to witness. I mean, if yeah. I'm running the batteries at Vicksburg, my life is in hell. <laughs> I mean, you could be standing next to Grant. You'd be all right. Oh, Grant was 20 miles upriver. <laughs> Exactly. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is Professor Emeritus at the United States Naval Academy, uh, Dr. Craig Lee Simons. We're going to move on to a book that you wrote as well. Decision at Sea, Five Naval Battles That Shaped American History. I'm going to read them off very quickly. And you obviously don't have to comment on every single one of them, but, but I think it's a very, very interesting list. And that's Oliver Hazard Perry's Victory at Lake Erie. Uh, the Battle of the Ironclads, Union Monitor versus the Confederate Virginia, Commodore Dewey's stunning triumph at Manila Bay during the Spanish-American War, the Seminole American victory at Midway, 19, June 1942, and then you mentioned Operation Praying Mantis in the Persian Gulf, where uh, computers, ship-fired missiles, and smart bombs changed the nature of warfare at sea. There are uh, maybe uh, two I would like to say that I was surprised didn't make your list. And then I want to talk about your list. Uh, battle of the Capes. Was that not Cho? That was the famous uh, battle uh, in the Atlantic off the American coast where the French defeated the British and foiled the attempt to rescue Cornwallis, who eventually surrendered on October 19th, uh, 1781 basically led to the end of the American Revolution. Did you not choose that because there were no American ships 
involved or did you just think it didn't rise to the top five? Okay, Robert, I'm going to tweak you here because clearly what you did was go to chapter one without reading the prologue. The prologue is a study of the Battle of the Capes where the French and the British fought off Yorktown in 1781. Yes, but it didn't make your five. But I made it a prologue instead of a chapter because, of course, there are no American forces in the battle. Although clearly without it, maybe there isn't even a United States at all. So well picked, but read the prologue. Well, I no, I did. And I just didn't know why I, I thought that the reason it didn't make the top five was because there were no American ships. The yeah. second one that I would mention, which I was surprised I didn't see. And by me being surprised means nothing because a, I was in the army and B you have the PhD and that is late a golf. And the only reason that I mentioned that, but just besides the size of it was the fact that so much that happened towards the end of World War II, in my view, especially when you're talking Iwo Jima, Okinawa, uh, to me, led to the decision by Truman to use the atomic bomb. And w- was that you figured, did you have Midway in there so you weren't going to have two World War II battles or or am I just kind of off base a little no, bit? About I think, yeah, pretty much. That's right. Leyte was the biggest naval battle in history. It covered four hundred thousand square miles more combat ships engaged than in any other battle in the history of the planet so yeah certainly Leyte is a big battle but here's if you look at those five one of the things to note is the technology Mm. employed in each Lake Erie is a battle of the age of sail all sailing ships the monitor armor and steam Dewey the age of the battleship Midway aircraft carriers Persian Gulf radar, missiles, and electronic weaponry. So those each represent a stage in the development of the character of naval combat, and each had a disproportionate impact on American policy at the time. Explain explain that with regard to, say, for example, Midway, disproportionate. You know, Midway is, Midway is scholarship has gone from, ah, we just got lucky, and which... You take a part. I've read in some of your interviews that, you know, it takes a lot of work to get that lucky and that there were certain things that the Americans couldn't disclose, which made it look like it was more of a roll of the dice um, than it was. But, for example, based on what you just said, put Midway into that context. Well, let me try this. Um, The Japanese had, I won't say overwhelming, but unquestionable superiority in naval combat platforms in the spring and summer of 1942. And had the United States lost the Battle of Midway, it almost certainly would have compelled uh, the United States to shift resources from the Atlantic to the Pacific to restore that balance. That would have upset uh, the Germany first grand strategy of the Allies, conceivably Mm -hmm. delayed the invasion of Europe, perhaps given Hitler time to develop the V2 with a nuclear warhead and so on and so on. I mean, you can extrapolate this out any way you want. But the Battle of Midway absolutely stopped Japanese offensive movements. They had plans to occupy uh, many more bases in the South Pacific uh, to hold Midway Island, for example, perhaps as a token for subsequent negotiations, and it gave the momentum to the Allied forces, which combined with the new weapons coming off the building ways in 1943, allowed the United States to take the offensive and allowed the Allies to keep the Germany first strategy. So I think there's a lot of reasons why Midway is not just an astonishing 10 minutes of fury. It's also an important strategic moment. That that Germany first point is extremely well taken because there were people within the United States government, uh, especially early on in the war, I think, and please correct me, that wanted to fight. Let's conquer Japan first. Like they're the ones who attacked us and let's get rid of them. And there were often uh, discussions where whether it was a Roosevelt or a Marshall Leahy or or King or whomever who who somewhat. I want to say threatened, but mentioned the fact that they would pay no political price for shifting their resources toward the Pacific. That is correct. Is the United States Navy during World War II the greatest fighting force in the history of the world? In April uh, 1942 to the end of the war, August, excuse me, April 1945 to August 1945, that's unquestionably true. You think of the 
just the carrier force alone, um, Pete Mitcher's uh, Task Force 58 consisted of 15 carriers mounting 1,300 airplanes escorted by scores of cruisers and 100 destroyers with 24 oilers to keep them all full of fuel. Mitcher himself said, I can go anywhere in the world and nothing can stop me. And he was right. There's been nothing like it since. Do you get the sense that naval history in some ways takes a backseat to to army history, for lack of a better term? Because there, there's no there's no battlefields for us to visit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was working on the Battle of Midway, I had I would tell people, "What are you working on now?" And so I'm writing a book on the Battle of Midway. So, oh, are you going to go visit the battlefield? Well, <laughs> no, because it's water. Now, when I wrote on Gettysburg, when I wrote about Pat Claiborne or Joe Johnston or anything about the Civil War, I would always go to the site. I would examine it. I'd walk the ground. You can't really do that at sea. So there may be something to that. But I think also there's a perception, and it's not entirely incorrect, that wars are won and lost based on who holds the ground. Navies can help you do that. They can get you there. They can feed you. They can support you. They can provide gunfire support. But you've got to hold that ground. The Air Force the same way. The Air Force has always claimed that it could win wars with strategic bombing. Never have, yeah. in my opinion, never will. They are a support force for ground troops. So I think it's appropriate that armies get the front page. My son, who did two tours in Afghanistan as a combat infantryman, and I would ask him, you know, lots of questions. And he would he would say on more than one occasion, and including just a few days ago, as we talked about it on his 32nd birthday, that as long as the army was there, the the regime had a chance. You yeah. didn't say anything about the Navy, no disrespect, or the Air Force, no, no disrespect. No, but big. as long as the army was there, they had a chance. And he said, as soon as we left, they had no chance. That's right. You wrote this book, and it's called Decision at Sea, Five Naval Battles That Shaped American History. Would you like to please give us five naval battles that shaped world history? Oh, gosh, sure. Um, Salamis, mm -hmm. uh, the battle of, between the Greeks and the Persians that allowed Greek civilization to survive and ended the Persian uh, ingression into Europe itself. Uh, Lepanto, which stopped mm -hmm. the Muslims. Uh, from taking over all of Southern Europe. They already had much of Iberia, uh, mm -hmm. certainly belongs in there. Uh, Trafalgar, without a doubt, in 1805, uh, where Nelson defeated the combined fleet of France mm -hmm. and Spain and uh, guaranteed British control of the sea through the rest of the Napoleonic Wars for the next decade. Um, Can I, may I just say that my lunch, my lunch group today, so far we're three for three, so my, right? my master's degree medieval history professor and a good friend of ours named Alex McAllister had lunch today and we were trying to come up with our five because I was going to ask you this question. So, so far we're three for three. Okay, that's good. Um, getting into the modern era, I, I would say probably, well, and, you're, and see, I have to choose between Midway and Leyte Gulf. So I'm going to stick with Midway because we already did, did that. Uh, and you want one more. Um, Actium? Actium is the one I was going to name, again, suppressing the Carthaginians. Uh, if the Roman Empire doesn't spread its culture across Europe, uh, then the world changes. So, yeah, I throw Actium in there, too. Uh, one book that you wrote that I have ordered and have not written, but I'm definitely going to, or excuse me, have ordered and have not read, but I'm definitely going to read based on the reviews and some of your interviews. And the book is called Neptune. Allied Invasion of Europe and the D-Day Landings. I find the title so instructive based on what I've read about the book. And that is June 6, 1944, wasn't even the beginning because the beginning is the logistical masterpiece that was, was pulled off. But there was so much more that happened, not only on the beaches after June 6, but inland in Europe as the war continued. Why did you choose to write a book on this subject and title it such? 
Well, you know, uh, there is a tendency, and I'm not going to blame Steven Spielberg and my friend Tom Hanks too much on this, but the sense that the the story of D-Day begins with the landing on Omaha Beach or Utah Beach or Gold, Juno, and Sword on, on the beaches of Normandy. But in, in many respects, that's the culmination of the story. Not only do the men have to get there and the ammunition and the supplies, but they have to be sustained there through almost continuous uh, influx of reinforcements and manpower and materiel and evacuating the POWs and the wounded and all of that tremendous, huge uh, logistical undertaking has, has like, it's kind of boring. I mean, logistics, who likes to read a book <laughs> about logistics, right? Nobody. Does. Let me read about the battle, but the battle can't happen absent the logistics. Uh, and, and, Perhaps too much of the book is about logistics. There are tables and such in there. Um, but I think you can't really understand the Allied move into Nazi-occupied Europe unless you understand the Herculean effort mm. that it took to prepare for D-Day, beginning really in 1942 rather than 1944. So that's that's what the book is about. As As readers... And I'm going to say as much or more, I would think, as historians, when when you're a history nut like like you, like uh, our engineer here, Chris Spangle or myself or others, you deal with with fighting inevitability. I already know how this is going to turn out. So what's the great mystery in some regards? Or you tend to. And this is something that I would I'm getting from this book about Normandy, that you assume that it was going to be a success no matter what. Clearly, at Normandy, that was not the case. That whether it's the longest day with John Wayne or saving Private Ryan with Tom Hanks, you know, it's it's going to work out. And how close did D-Day, did Normandy come to, if not being a failure, at least changing shape considerably, especially on Omaha Beach. That's a great insight uh, to note that because we know how it comes out, there's a tendency to think, well, of course, this is foreordained. Of course, it's going to work. There are 4,000 ships out there. There's 180,000 men coming ashore. We had more firepower, more ammunition, more money than the enemy did at the point of contact. Um, but it was an extraordinarily near-run thing as Wellington uh, said of Waterloo, um, particularly on Omaha Beach. And there was a moment, and I have read arguments on both sides of eyewitnesses who say they saw this happen and others who say they don't believe it, but where Omar Bradley actually wrote out a recall order for Omaha Beach because the beachfront was crowded with wrecked and broken landing craft. The, uh, the second, third, fourth, fifth waves couldn't get ashore because it was too crowded. The first two waves were pinned down on the beach because they were in a crossfire of machine guns from high ground. And rather than just shove more troops into there, he was going to pull them out. Imagine what that would have been like. If mm. going ashore is hard, pulling a Dunkirk under fire is harder and move them to Utah Beach, where there was a marshy lay behind the landing ground, which would have, oh, who knows what. But so did it come close? Closer than I think most viewers of those films um, could imagine. Um, but obviously it succeeded. What did you think when you were in the theater, unless you saw it at a special screening? My mother was in the Marine Corps. Uh, and she and I went to go see Saving Private Ryan, and it inexplicably did not win the Oscar. So I've been boycotting the Oscars ever since. Yeah. But it was the only movie, only one of two movies. And the other one was Schindler's List, where mm -hmm. after the movie was done, nobody got up. What did you think as a as a historian of someone well, who, who studied that when when the front gate of the LST comes down? Well, to be honest with you, Robert, I was ready for it. Um, the um, Spielberg had asked uh, Steve Ambrose mm. to take a look at the rushes of the first 20 minutes. 
And 10 minutes in, Steve told me I had to tell him to stop the film. I couldn't see because my eyes were watering. <clears throat> so he had told me that, and I was kind of ready uh, for what was coming. Uh, but even so, it, it's so it, such a punch in the gut. Um, yeah. If you had been advising Harry Truman in the summer of 1945, after witnessing what had happened in the last, let's say, uh, I think uh, Iwo Jima is February 19th, I think, 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my great uncle, who drove an LST in seven major campaigns in the Pacific War, uh, just happened to manage to get in a fist fight the day before and was in the brig and missed Iwo Jima. But he did come back to uh, uh, land in Okinawa. If you are advising Harry Truman about whether to use the atomic bomb, what would you have said? I, I deal with this at some length in, in some of my later books, and including the one I just, just finished on Chester Nimitz. I think that uh, I would have advised him to use the weapon um, partly to save American lives in the hope that this would make an invasion unnecessary. And partly to save Japanese lives. And let me explain that. Mm -hmm. Japan's warrior culture was such that surrender, particularly unconditional surrender, which is what the Allies had demanded, was such so shameful that death was preferable. The Japanese government was perfectly ready to, they talked, and this is a phrase actually used in the cabinet, the honorable death of 100 million that every single Japanese human being should die rather than Japan surrendering unconditionally to the Allies. What was required was some otherworldly, extraordinary, out of the realm of human behavior and belief to come in and intrude and break that cultural view. So I think even though 100,000 people died in Hiroshima, give or take, and another 80, 60 to 80,000 at Nagasaki, it might have saved the lives of millions because it got Hirohito to say, I'm overruling my cabinet. I must save the lives of my people. And that's what he did. We talked just for a second about uh, famous naval battles and, and one that I see gets mentioned quite a bit. And it's somewhat nebulous because you're not pointing to individual islands or particular areas. Was, was the were the battles of the Atlantic in both the Great War and World War II? Is it because, other than Jutland, perhaps the absence of these kind of set piece, you know, battleship like uh, games that we see that that the Battle of the Atlantic just doesn't seem to get the coverage it perhaps needs? Um, I think that's a fair statement. The Battle of the Atlantic, of course, is less a battle than a campaign. It begins yeah, point. really in 1940 when the war begins in Europe and lasts at least through the end of 1943 before the U-boats are suppressed. And they're never entirely suppressed, but the key of it is in 1942 and 1943. Uh, I do deal with this at some length in my big fat book, World War II at Sea. I don't know if you've seen that one or not. I have. Uh, but it's got uh, big sections on it, uh, four sections interspersed through the narrative, which is chronological, uh, about the Battle of the Atlantic. And I think it is strategically absolutely crucial. Nothing else can happen without it. Lend-Lease dies. D-Day is impossible. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't get into Torch or, or Sicily or Italy or do anything else unless you win the Battle of the Atlantic. And it was a battle that involved logistics, but it also involved the kind of confrontations that my friend Tom Hanks portrays in the movie Greyhound, which if you haven't seen, you should watch. You mentioned just a few minutes ago, you are writing a biography, is this correct, of Chester Nimitz, the I'm Fleet writing Admiral? A, I'm writing, I've just finished, in fact, uh, a wartime biography, Nimitz at War is the title, and it begins the day he takes command in Pearl Harbor on the last day of 1941, and it ends 
with his signing the Instrument of Surrender on board the battleship Missouri in 1945. So it's not a full biography, but it's an, an assessment of the campaign in the Pacific that he ran during those 3,591 days. We would love to have you back on the podcast to discuss that. One of the best books I've ever read on World War II was called The Admirals by uh, oh, yeah. Walter Bornman. Walter Bornman, it? yeah. It's, it was a terrific. For someone like me who hasn't read a ton of naval history, it was a wonderful uh, uh, trip through uh, not only the Pacific War, what was going on in the Atlantic, but also you know the bureaucratic infighting and, yeah. and over resources yeah. and various things. Uh, there, th- that's the book that I just mentioned is about the five star admirals of right. World War II, or right. Leahy, who's the top ranking uh, military official in in the entire uh, enterprise, uh, outranks a marshal I think by a day. Yep. As they went through the five stars, and it's Leahy, King, Halsey, and Nimitz, uh, and Nimitz should... outranked Eisenhower by one day. One... <laughs> it was. Let's see if I get this right. It was Leahy, Marshall, King, MacArthur, Nimitz, Eisenhower, Arnold, Halsey, Bradley. I'm not gonna argue with you. I, I would have to check Robert to be <laughs> honest. I can tell you the sequence of Navy admirals, but. I don't know how to intersperse all those generals in there. Should should our 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 pride of Indianapolis, Raymond Spruance, have received a fifth star? Oh we had Oh boy, there's a campaign going on now. I suppose you probably know about it to well, try to get him a fifth star posthumously. And and an argument can be made for that. I talked with uh well, I won't say who, but I talked to some people who are in on the decision, and, and it came down to it that statutory uh authorization only allowed four. So obviously Leahy, King, and Nimitz were going to get three. And who was going to get the fourth? And it was between Halsey and Spruance. And Nimitz wanted Spruance, and so did King. But the Congress wanted Halsey because of what he did early in the war in 1942 with those carrier raids into the Marshalls and Wake and elsewhere that boosted American morale at a time when it was desperately needed. And of course, he was such great copy. You know, they asked him what his strategy was, and he said, kill Japs, kill Japs, kill more Japs. You would never find Raymond Spruant saying anything like that. And I think that's the reason he got the fifth star. Clearly, Spruant was more deserving, in my personal view, than Halsey was. I don't know what good it would do now to give him a fifth star posthumously. I don't know if his grandchildren get a bigger pension or not, I, whatever it is. But uh, if you're asking in terms of merit, then yes, I would put Spruance ahead of Halsey. And our late and great distinguished Senator Richard Luger, who was a, an aide to Arlie Burke, he, as I recall, well, he and he, uh, Richard Luger and Raymond Spruance went to the same high school uh, years apart. But as I recall, Senator Luger was a big part of that drive to get yeah. Admiral Spruance his fifth star. Uh, yeah. One last thing I want to mention as part of your career, because, you know, we do it because we're Americans and we sometimes can't help it. Uh, you were a visiting lecturer about 25 years ago, at the Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, England. Right. What was that like to be, I hate to say a Yank, but I suppose you were? It was a blast. Um, Yeah. In fact, there was a, the newspaper story they did on me, you're calling me a Yank, it was called A Yank in Drake's Country. Um, But it was fun. It's a completely different system. The British Naval Academy is one year. And so what they get is a, 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 condensed program uh, that's heavily professional. Uh, And the course I taught them on strategic studies was the only course they had beyond, you know, how to make the radar work and the engines run and those kinds of things. Um, But they're really bright, eager young people. They come straight out of uh, uh, what we would call high school, A-level high schools. So they're young. They're 18, 19. Um, but I have to tell you, my favorite group that I taught at Britannia Royal Naval College was people that they called the special duty students. We would call them Mustangs. These are former enlisted personnel, mm. sergeant or petty officer, and were recognized as being really bright, never went to college, maybe didn't finish high school, but really good at their job. And they were plucked out of their enlisted ranks and sent to get a little polish at BRNC and a commission. That's the smartest group of people I ever taught. 
And I've taught at the Naval Academy for 30 years. Was it fun just to be immersed? I mean, you know, whether it's, I mean, the British go back to the Battle of Sluz, which is, I think, is 1340 no. and the Hundred Years' War. And, and, and that yes. all those, those centuries of where, you know, they ruled the waves. And, and how did they deal with the fact that, you know, clearly over the ensuing decades, they had been eclipsed or, or did they just not acknowledge it? Well, yeah, no, I, they recognized they weren't the greatest naval power in the world a- anymore, but they also clung to that gossamer of that we were for a long time. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the classes they took was on the, the Falklands War, which had just ended. Mm-hmm. And they talked about that like it was World War Three. This was the biggest event you ever heard of. <laughs> the British won the Falklands War, and God bless them, so they did. We have reached the point in the Leaders and Legends podcast where we ask the same five questions of all of our guests. I promise they're harmless, Professor. Are you ready? Okay. What was your first job? Uh, my first, well, I had summer jobs, of course. I slung burgers at what was called the Yacht Bar, in Tomorrowland in Disneyland as my summer job when I was a college student. We count that one? That's that's as unique as I've gotten so far. Okay. Number two, what was your first concert? <sighs> uh, my first concert was to go see um, uh, the Kingston Trio in 1963. I know I can name some of their songs. I just can't think of any right now. I can certainly see the striped pants. Yeah, <laughs> and the straw hats, yeah. <laughs> Number three, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Well, I told you earlier that the book that made me a naval historian uh, was the series written by C.S. Forster on Hornblower. And the first one I ever picked up was Commodore Hornblower. So that has a, a special place for me. I think uh, Forrester was was so good at creating a realistic environment as well as realistic characters. So uh, I'll say Commodore Hornblower by C.S. Forrester. I asked you this question a few minutes ago about the Civil War. I'm going to make it perhaps a bit more difficult. If you could witness any event in history, be there as it happens, which event would you choose? Well, if I could be there to stop it, I'd get in front of John Wilkes Booth and take his gun away. How's that? That's that's a great answer. And on YouTube, you can uh, there's a great show that used to be around in the 1950s and it was called I've Got a Secret. Yes, I remember it. And you had to guess what the secret is. And if you go on YouTube, there is a man whose secret is I was at Ford's Theater and saw John Wilkes Booth shoot Abraham Lincoln. Oh, my God. He must have been 105 years old. He looks it if he wasn't. But the crowd just absolutely gasps when they when they reveal what his secret is. Okay. The last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record to talk about anything you want, whom would you choose? <laughs> Come on now, Robert. You know I'm going to be in trouble if I say anything other than, well, of course, my wife. That's who I want to have dinner with. <laughs> Well, that's a popular answer, but, you know, let's say that she's got a headache. (laughs) She has a headache and can't go. Oh, because he's such a cool cat. How about Barack Obama? He's the most popular choice, uh, I think, by far. And the only person who would be close would be George W. Bush, who we know is a huge history buff. Huge. Yeah. And he's not living anymore, but I would have loved to have dinner with George H. W. Uh. Bush who I think was a great gentleman. You are listening and you have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends, LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been Craig Simons, professor emeritus at the United States Naval Academy, best-selling author who's won every prize I think there is to win. And as someone who's read at least three of his books, I can tell you he is a brilliant writer. Thank you very much for coming on the Leaders and Legends podcast. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. 
Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.